Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. In the early morning hours of April 9th, 2008, a woman in the city of Albemarle, North Carolina, received a call from her friend, 22-year-old Jamie Fraley. Jamie was calling from her apartment about an hour's drive away in Gastonia, a large suburb just west of the city of Charlotte. Jamie had been spending a quiet night at home, making other calls and sending emails. She had been trying to keep her mind off of a sudden and violent illness she had been experiencing that day, for which she had already gone to the hospital. Midway through the call, however, Jamie cut the conversation short. She explained that her symptoms had gotten worse and that she couldn't stand it anymore. Not long after mentioning this, Jamie said that her ride was there. He was going to take her back to the hospital in his truck. With that, the pair said goodnight and hung up. Aside from Jamie's concerning illness, at the time, the conversation had seemed completely normal to her friend. However, what the woman didn't know, what she couldn't have known, was that this would be the last that anyone would hear from Jamie Fraley. While many mysteries would emerge in the days following Jamie's disappearance, one thing is chillingly clear. No record exists of the 22-year-old ever making it to a hospital that morning. This terrifying fact is just a single loose end in a case teeming with unanswered questions, one whose central investigation would be derailed by one of the most frustrating and heartbreaking twists imaginable. This is the story of Jamie Michelle Fraley. Before we get to today's list, as we sometimes do, we wanted to offer a bit of a disclaimer. In our research, we came across quite a few areas where sources appeared to contradict each other, particularly as it relates to the timeline of this case. We've tried our best to point out wherever we think there's an area of disagreement, but we just wanted to let you know for the sake of transparency. Additionally, if you find our content interesting and informative and haven't already, We'd be honored if you'd take a second to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell. It helps you to keep up with our latest releases, and helps us to keep up with that pesky, ever-changing YouTube algorithm. With that out of the way, let's get to the video. From the moment that she was born, Jamie Fraley's life was an uphill battle. She was clinically dead at the time of her delivery, needing to be revived through CPR, and suffered a variety of health complications due to her traumatic birth. Doctors told her mother, Kim, that they didn't expect her daughter to reach the age of one. Despite this harrowing prognosis, Kim and other members of the family soon watched as time and time again, Jamie defied the odds. She was frail, struggled to gain weight, and had numerous health problems. But no matter how many times doctors predicted the worst, Jamie would pull through. Not only that, through it all, somehow she was vibrant, high-spirited, and exceptionally kind. Those that knew her often spoke of her big heart, her passion for helping people, and the way that she could always see the best in others. This isn't to say that there weren't challenges that were harder for Jamie to overcome. At the age of 18, she was dealt yet another blow when she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She disliked her medication, telling her mother that it made her feel strange and would often stop taking it. The combined weight of these mental health issues with her existing physical ones made it difficult for her to keep up with her peers as she got older. She didn't graduate high school, never obtained her driver's license, and became increasingly dependent on family, particularly her mother Kim. Eventually, though, like she had throughout her life, Jamie found a way to push forward. With the aid of social assistance and a government-appointed health care provider, she was able to move out of her mother's house and into her own apartment in Gastonia. She began attending Gaston College as a part-time student and started working towards her GED, making clear goals for her future. More than anything, she dreamed of becoming a drug counselor, and wanted to help people overcome drug addiction. True to character, Jamie's interest in becoming a counselor had started when one of her friends was battling addiction and she wanted to help. 
She discovered that there was a weekly program held at the local church that she attended, and Jamie began going to see what she could learn about aiding those that wanted to turn their lives around. Jamie's convictions became even stronger when in 2006, at the age of 20, she met the love of her life, Ricky Simons Jr. Ricky had come to Jamie's defense during an altercation that she was involved in, and it was more or less love at first sight. Though Ricky struggled with drugs off and on and had been in trouble with the law, like everyone in her life, Jamie saw the best in him. Before long, the couple had moved in together at the Copperfield apartment complex on Lowell Bethesda Road and were engaged to be married. Just when it seemed like everything was going well for Jamie, however, life threw her another curveball. In early January of 2007, Ricky was convicted of felony larceny, and due to his previous record, he was sentenced to 15 months in jail. Understandably, Jamie's family had their reservations about the relationship after Ricky was locked up. They wondered if he was the right man for her, and worried about Jamie because she now lived roughly an hour's drive away from the rest of her family. Even though Jamie had taken major steps towards her independence in the past few years, they knew that she still required a lot of help with everyday things, specifically anything that required transportation because she still couldn't drive. Jamie brushed off these concerns, however. She was completely in love with Ricky and wrote him every single day that he was away in jail. Besides, she said, she not only had the assistance of her healthcare provider, she had additional support from Ricky's family. His father, Ricky Simon Sr., was a maintenance worker at their apartment complex, and he lived just two doors down with his girlfriend, Kim Springer. As months passed, Jamie's family started to worry less and less. Ricky Sr. and Kim did step in to help Jamie with whatever she needed, and the three of them also spent increasingly large amounts of time together. By the spring of 2008, it seemed like it would only be a matter of time before Jamie and Ricky Jr. would be together again, this time for good. Sadly, it was a reunion that would never happen. Okay, so just before we get into this next section, as previously mentioned, let's talk about the timeline. For starters, a lot of dates and times we came across in our research for this case either straight up contradicted each other, or a bunch of events were mentioned where no specific date or time was attributed to them. We've done our best to sift through this stuff, but this appears to be a problem even in the most detailed sources where family members have actually given interviews. In general, we've been more deferential to these more detailed sources, which is why we're starting our timeline from April 8th, 2008, even though a number of reports state that this all started on the 7th. So yeah, just take it with a grain of salt. With that said, let's get back to it. On the morning of April 8th, 2008, Jamie woke up with a terrible pain in her stomach. She initially tried to deal with it the best she could on her own, but after a couple of hours, she called her healthcare provider, who arrived a short time later and drove her to the hospital. Once there, Jamie was told that she had the flu and was sent home with a prescription. Upon returning to her apartment, Jamie called her aunt, Stacy Dennis, explaining what had happened that morning. She said that she was still feeling pretty bad and that she feared that she had been misdiagnosed, but had decided to spend the day in bed trying to recover. Later that afternoon, Kim Sprenger stopped by Jamie's apartment to pick up her dog. Kim and Ricky Sr. had broken up a couple of months earlier, and Jamie had offered to dog sit for her in order to help her out. Seeing that Jamie was still in bed, Kim offered to drop off the prescription she had been given that morning at a nearby pharmacy so that it could at least be ready for someone else to pick up later. It appears that Jamie agreed to this, and Kim did drop off the prescription though sources disagree as to whether the medicine was ever collected. Regardless, by late that evening, Jamie was still feeling terrible and decided that she needed to return to the hospital. This time, she called Ricky Sr. for a ride, who drove her there and dropped her off shortly after. Much to her dismay, Jamie soon learned that the hospital was extremely busy that night and she was told it would likely be three to four hours at least before she would be able to see a doctor. 
Unwilling to wait that long, Jamie decided to head back home. She phoned Ricky Sr. first, who failed to pick up, before getting a hold of a friend who was able to give her a ride. She returned to her apartment alone around midnight. Not long after getting back, Jamie called her mother Kim Fraley, explaining that she had a fever and chills. Kim offered to pick her up and drive her to her house where she was welcome to spend the night, but Jamie declined. She said that she had an important appointment the next morning at the Social Security office, and she was adamant that she didn't want to miss it. Because her mother's house was about an hour's drive away, Jamie worried about getting there on time. She told her mother that she loved her, and the two hung up. From here, Jamie sent a few emails and made some phone calls to other people in her life. None of these communications were out of the ordinary in any way, with the exception of Jamie mentioning her illness, though none of her behaviors appeared strange or concerning. At around 1.30 a.m. on April 9th, Jamie would place her final confirmed phone call to her friend in the city of Albemarle. It was during this conversation that she stated she was planning on going back to the hospital for a third time due to her symptoms, and that she would be getting a ride. When she cut off the conversation, she said, quote, I have to go. My ride is here. He is here. While Jamie did not say who was giving her this ride to the hospital, she did offer two important clues. First, that the driver was male, and second, that he would be taking her in his truck. After this call, as far as we know, Jamie Fraley was never heard from again. There is also no record of her being admitted to any hospital following this conversation. Several hours after the early morning phone call with her friend, Jamie's healthcare provider arrived at her apartment expecting to take her to the scheduled appointment at the Social Security office. However, after finding the door locked and knocking repeatedly and receiving no answer, the provider left. They would reportedly place several calls to Jamie that day, which would also go unanswered. Either one or two days later, sources contradict each other yet again, Jamie's mother Kim received a call from the healthcare provider. They explained that her daughter had missed her appointment on April 9th and that several attempts to reach her had been unsuccessful. While Kim and other family members had not been worried about not hearing from Jamie up until this point, since it wasn't that out of the ordinary, this news immediately set them on edge. In particular, Kim remembered how important the social security appointment had been to her daughter and was positive that she wouldn't have missed it unless something had physically stopped her. Kim's immediate concern was that Jamie's illness had grown worse after she had last spoken to her, and that it was possible that she might be trapped in her apartment, unable to get to the front door or her cell phone. After getting off the phone with the healthcare provider, she quickly phoned Jamie herself, and when that was unsuccessful, she called police in Gastonia and requested a welfare check. When authorities arrived at Jamie's apartment, they found the door to her unit locked and had to be let in by the complex manager. They took a quick look around, but said that they didn't see anything of concern, reporting no signs of a struggle or forced entry. Officers told Kim that her daughter had probably just stepped out for a bit and that she would likely be back soon. Understandably, this did little to quell Kim's concerns, and before long, she along with Jamie's aunt and cousin, Stacy and Haley Dennis, decided to pay a visit to the Copperfield Apartments themselves. Just like police, the three women found Jamie's door locked, though when they entered, they realized that her keys were actually inside. Concerningly, so were her wallet, purse, and ID. In fact, the only major possession of Jamie's that appeared to be missing was her cell phone. While Jamie would sometimes leave the house with just her phone, this was only for extremely short trips, perhaps a visit to a neighbor's place. It wasn't like her to go anywhere for an extended period of time while leaving her wallet, purse, keys, and identification behind. When the women entered Jamie's bedroom, they were even less convinced that she had simply walked off. Like police, they didn't find any signs of a struggle, Though, there was dried vomit on the floor that suggested she had been quite sick and in no condition to be going anywhere. 
Perhaps the most concerning detail, though, was a pair of Jamie's shoes that had been left at the top of her apartment stairs. Her family members immediately recognized these as the shoes Jamie wore almost everywhere, yet they were completely missing their laces. The 22-year-old had never been seen wearing these shoes without laces before, and the only other footwear she was known to put on was the occasional pair of flip-flops. With this batch of strange discoveries, Kim, Stacy, and Haley decided to call police for a second time. When they explained what they had found, officers returned to the apartment for a closer look. They reportedly remained skeptical that anything out of the ordinary had happened until things took a chilling turn. While police were searching through the apartment, the three women continued to call Jamie's cell phone. They had lost count of how many times they had called, when suddenly, someone picked up. Almost immediately after the cell phone call connected, Kim's heart dropped when she realized that it was a man's voice on the other end. He explained that he was a cable worker who had been out on a job site when he had heard a cell phone ringing at the side of the road. Police immediately traveled to where this man was at the intersection of New Hope Road and Hudson Boulevard, roughly a mile and a half from Jamie's apartment. The phone was pretty scuffed up, and based on where it was found, officers theorized that it might have been thrown from a moving vehicle. It was still working, though, and they hoped that it might yield useful clues. Believing Jamie's family members when they told them that she never went anywhere without her cell phone, police now knew that they had a missing persons investigation on their hands. Over the next several days, authorities conducted multiple searches in the vicinity of Jamie's apartment, as well as in the wooded area immediately surrounding where her phone was found. They also began questioning the 22-year-old's neighbors, asking them if they'd seen anything unusual. Aside from one person who said that they had seen Jamie return to her apartment alone around midnight on the day she was sick, no one reported witnessing anything strange on the morning of her disappearance. However, several people did point police in the direction of someone that they were wary of. Jamie's neighbor and future father-in-law, Ricky Simon Sr., Neighbors stated that Ricky Sr. spent a lot of time around Jamie and that he was constantly giving her rides and doing stuff for her. Jamie also seemed to spend a good deal of time at his apartment. While this wasn't necessarily news to Jamie's family, it wasn't long before police dropped a bombshell on them. They would soon discover that there were quite a few things they didn't know about Ricky Simon Sr., for starters, they didn't know that Ricky Sr. had broken up with his girlfriend, Kim Sprenger. One of the reasons was their mutual drug habit. Kim wanted to get her life back on track and felt that she couldn't do so because Ricky Sr. was unwilling to make changes. It turned out, though, that there was another, more alarming reason for the breakup. Kim was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with Ricky Sr.'s seeming obsession with his future daughter-in-law. In her mind, what had started out as plausible fatherly affection had morphed into something sinister. Once Ricky Jr. was incarcerated, it had only gotten worse, with Sr. doing things like constantly making inappropriate jokes towards Jamie and commenting on what she was wearing. Apparently, Kim Sprenger wasn't the only person who noticed this dynamic either. Jamie's cousin Haley would later say that she knew about Ricky Sr.'s unwanted advances but that Jamie always felt that she could handle the situation. She wanted to preserve the relationship between her future husband and his father, and also believed that things might change if she could help him through his drug addiction. However, the most concerning news about Ricky Sr. was yet to come. When police conducted a background check on him, they discovered that he had quite the criminal record. Like his son, these offenses were largely theft and drug-related, with one major exception. In 1986, he was arrested after fatally strangling his ex-girlfriend, Donna Miller. Though Ricky Sr. was initially charged with first-degree murder, he was admitted to a psychiatric institution following his arrest upon threatening to take his own life. He was ultimately convicted of manslaughter instead of murder 
and though he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, he was let out after just six for good behavior. When Ricky Sr. was brought in for questioning about Jamie's disappearance, he stated that he had given Jamie a ride to the hospital on the evening of April 8th, the second time she went there that day. However, he denied speaking with her or seeing her after that. Police found Ricky Sr. to be mostly cooperative while they were speaking to him, but noted that he appeared oddly cold towards the idea that Jamie was missing, and it felt like he was giving them as little information as possible. Despite having no concrete evidence against Ricky Simon Sr., police continued to uncover details about him that suggested he might know more than he was letting on. In particular, they began to theorize that he might have been the person who Jamie was referring to in her final call to her friend when she said she was getting a ride to the hospital for a third time. While authorities knew that Ricky Sr. drove a white panel van and not a truck, they felt that Jamie might have simply misspoken, or else maybe didn't really know or care about the difference between these kinds of vehicles. Additionally, not long into the investigation, police received another call about a suspicious roadside discovery. It turned out to be a bag of trash located about 2.5 miles away from the Copperfield apartment complex. This bag of trash is perhaps one of the most mysterious aspects of this case, as it was obviously interesting enough for investigators to focus on, though as far as we can tell, no information was ever released about what it contained. Even more mysteriously, police somehow connected the bag of trash to Ricky Sr., who apparently admitted that it belonged to him. He claimed that he had gotten a flat tire while driving, had removed the bag to get his spare tire, and had simply forgotten to pick it back up again. Equally as interesting as what might have been in the bag was where it was found. Investigators later stated that the site formed a near-perfect triangle with the apartment complex and where Jamie's cell phone had been found. This seemed to suggest a possible route that Ricky Sr. might have traveled on the morning of Jamie's disappearance. As strange as all of this was, investigators needed a lot more if they were going to make any kind of real progress in the case. Unfortunately, not a single additional trace of Jamie was found during repeated searches. In another crushing blow, her cell phone also failed to yield useful evidence. The device had reportedly been handled too many times by the time it made its way into evidence to pull reliable fingerprints or DNA from. Similar to the trash bag, the cell phone's call records revealed more questions than answers. The phone had made several outgoing calls at around 4.30 a.m. on the day Jamie went missing, but none of them were apparently connected to her disappearance. These calls are sort of confusing, as pretty much every source that mentions them says that they were from the phone's list of recent calls dialed, but it's unclear exactly what is meant by this. If you know, definitely feel free to tell us in the comments section below. In addition to these, there was apparently one other incoming call at around 5am, but sources state that police were unable to figure out who it was from. With little else to go on, and searches and tips revealing no new clues, Investigators once again returned to the only real person of interest they had in the case, Ricky Simon Sr. While the Fraley family initially didn't want to believe that he could be involved, after several weeks with no answers, and with a number of red flags seemingly raised in his direction, their suspicions were mounting as well. Even his son, Ricky Jr., was starting to worry that his father might have been involved. After learning what had led to the suspicions against him, he was furious, and when he was released from jail three weeks after Jamie's disappearance, he decided to temporarily stay with his fiancée's family rather than live with his father. Things reached a disturbing crescendo when during a phone call between Kim Fraley and Ricky Sr., Sr. made a comment that chilled the mother to her core. While explaining that he believed that Jamie had been abducted, he allegedly stated that perhaps whoever had taken her, quote, wasn't ready to give her back yet. Now believing that their best hope of finding Jamie was to keep tabs on Ricky Sr., police obtained a warrant to track his vehicle. A device was put in place for about a month, after which investigators went back to take a look at the data. What they found was incredibly disturbing. 
but it was not at all what they expected. Instead of being led to Jamie Fraley, when investigators took a look at the information they had collected about Ricky Sr.'s movements, they realized that he had been stalking his ex-girlfriend, Kim Springer. When police informed Kim, she was understandably terrified, saying that her car had recently been broken into and several personal items had been stolen, including her purse and keys. Fearing for her safety and on the advice of authorities, Kim filed a restraining order against Ricky Simon Sr., which was granted sometime that May. Just a few weeks later, on June 7, 2008, Kim was driving when she noticed a strange and unpleasant odor in her car. She looked around a bit, searching for the smell, but since it was the weekend and she was busy and had a lot of other things on her mind, she didn't pay much attention to it. It wasn't until two days later that she thought to check her trunk. When Kim finally opened the trunk of the vehicle, she was stunned and horrified by what she saw. It was the partially decomposed remains of Ricky Simon Sr. Police were immediately called to the scene, after which they started to make a series of startling discoveries. Several of the items that Kim had reported missing from the recent vehicle theft were found with Ricky Sr.'s body, as well as a large knife. An autopsy later revealed that Ricky Sr. had died from hyperthermia, or overheating. Temperatures had been hovering at around 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 32 degrees Celsius recently, and a mixture of drugs and alcohol were also found in Ricky Sr.'s system. Police theorized that he had been planning to ambush his ex-girlfriend by hiding in the trunk of her car, but at some point had succumbed to heat exhaustion. This, plus his high level of intoxication, authorities reasoned, was why he hadn't been able to pull the emergency release in the vehicle's trunk to allow himself to escape. The theory was further substantiated when investigators spoke with friends of Ricky Sr.'s. They claimed that he had told them about the planned ambush on Kim Springer, saying that he wanted to give her, quote, the surprise of her life. While the death of Ricky Simon Sr. was likely a relief to Kim Springer, the news couldn't have been more devastating for Kim Fraley and the rest of Jamie's family. Now convinced that Ricky Sr. was the person responsible for her disappearance, or at the very least, knew something, they feared that whatever secrets he had, he had now taken them to his grave. Sadly, it turned out that these fears were well-grounded, as while the investigation into Jamie Fraley's disappearance was never closed, the case more or less fell apart following Ricky Sr.'s death. To this day, at least officially, what happened to Jamie remains a mystery, and no further trace of her has ever been found. Given the length of time that this case has gone officially unsolved, it's no surprise that many theories about Jamie's disappearance have emerged over the years. In our opinion, however, all of them tend to fall into three main categories, which we'll do our best to summarize and discuss here starting with perhaps the most obvious, and in our opinion, the most likely theory, is that Ricky Simon Sr. was directly responsible for Jamie's abduction and probable murder. All signs appear to point to him having an unhealthy obsession with his son's fiance, and given what we know about him allegedly getting more aggressive with his advances towards Jamie, it's easy to see how things might have gotten out of hand, especially if he sensed that she was vulnerable due to her illness. Keep in mind that Ricky Sr. also had to know that his son was going to be released from jail in a few weeks' time, so it's possible that he had some sort of warped idea that this was his last chance to make a move on Jamie while Ricky Jr. was still out of the picture. In terms of how this went down, it's hard to say, though it's clear that Ricky Sr. had a lot of access to Jamie, and likely her apartment as well not just as her neighbor, but also as a maintenance worker at her apartment complex. Unfortunately, none of the sources we came across definitively state whether Ricky Sr. would have had access to some type of master key, but even without one, he could have easily knocked on Jamie's door and attacked her there. 
Many people who believe this theory have also speculated that Jamie's missing shoelaces might have been used by Ricky Sr. either to restrain her during an attack or to strangle her. That being said, there were definitely some unanswered questions and or reasons to be suspicious in terms of Ricky Sr. being the culprit. For starters, there's the fact that he had Jamie in his vehicle earlier that same night before she disappeared, but apparently didn't attack her. It's unclear why then, if he was planning to abduct her anyway, why he would have waited until later. Then there's the fact that there was apparently no record of Jamie calling Ricky Sr. for a second time to be taken to the hospital. Even if she did, and he was somehow able to delete that call, why wouldn't he also have deleted the previous call she had made to him that day? Finally, there's the whole white van versus truck discrepancy from the final call to Jamie's friend. To be honest, this one doesn't really seem like that big of a deal to us personally. We tend to agree with the police that some people just use truck and van interchangeably. But needless to say, some people are bothered by it and believe it's evidence Ricky Sr. wasn't the person who picked up Jamie right before her disappearance. Building off of this, the second theory is that Jamie was abducted and killed by another person, one either known or unknown to Ricky Sr. Perhaps Ricky Sr. merely covered for this suspect, or maybe the person was completely unrelated to him. While this is possible, if Ricky Sr. was really innocent, it still feels like the culprit would have had to be known to Jamie. The timing on the mysterious person who was giving her a ride to the hospital just feels too important to simply be a random piece of information. It's worth pointing out here that at least one person has claimed to be responsible for Jamie's abduction and murder. That confession, made by convicted kidnapper and killer Jerry Case, came in 2015 and was in the form of a letter to a local newspaper. While police checked out the claim, it was eventually dismissed as Case was incarcerated at the time of Jamie's disappearance and was unable to provide details of the investigation that hadn't already been made public. The third and final major theory in the case is that there was no foul play involved in Jamie Fraley's disappearance and that she really did walk off as police initially theorized. This theory goes that she either started a new life or that she died of exposure after walking off into the night, possibly due to some sort of mental health issue or as a result of the illness she was dealing with. In our opinion, this is the least likely of all of the explanations for Jamie's disappearance. While it's a known fact that Jamie often didn't take her bipolar medication, it doesn't seem to make sense that she would simply up and vanish especially since she seemed genuinely happy with her life and gave no indication of acting even slightly out of the ordinary, right up to and including during her final phone call. Finally, though this isn't really a theory, during our research we came across a lot of people who seemed particularly bothered by the explanation given for Ricky Sr.'s death. Some posit that even if extremely intoxicated, his plan to ambush Kim Springer didn't really make a whole lot of sense and seems irrational given that he was already a person of interest in Jamie's disappearance. Indeed, it seems that Ricky Jr. himself struggled to wrap his head around it. In the aftermath, he famously stated during a television interview, quote, First my fiancé goes missing, then my dad climbs in a trunk and dies. Does that make sense to anybody? It's hard to know what to say to this other than the fact that Ricky Sr.'s involvement in Jamie's disappearance and the subsequent reasoning given for his death still makes more sense than any of the alternative explanations out there that we've come across. At the time of this recording, we are rapidly approaching the 15th anniversary of Jamie Fraley's disappearance. Her family is still desperately searching for answers refusing to quit until they know the truth once and for all. As Kim Fraley stated in an interview in 2020, quote, Until you show me different, I'm going to have hope that Jamie's alive. Of course, with a case this old, it's likely going to take something new to get any kind of closure. Whether that's a tip, a piece of missing evidence, or something else remains to be seen. Regardless, we hope that for the sake of Jamie and her family, that vital missing piece is found as soon as possible. 
If you or anyone you know has information about the disappearance of Jamie Michelle Fraley, please contact the Gaston County Police Department in North Carolina or Crime Stoppers. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain, but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and take care.